David Ware, and I'm intrigued on your transition from Brentford to, to, to Rangers. How did that come about? And was he part of that process? Obviously, paying for Rangers and informing you on, on the football club and the significance of it as an institution? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, obviously, what happened at Brentford happened at Brentford in terms of Matthew and I. Um, but because we had, had we got to the playoffs and just missed out in the Premier League, because of that, your CV is strong. So therefore, I was very fortunate. Chris, you'd have some good offers on the table. Some big clubs had, had made offers and I'd met with them. And that side of things is all fairly new to me. You know, I'd come from the academy, gone into, only been at Brentford and suddenly you're, you're speaking to clubs as a kid. I'm growing up. These are major institutions. And uh, and that was a very privileged position to be in. And then Rangers came along and David Weir, so you need to speak to them. So this is Rangers. And I, as a kid, I've always said before, you know, I remember on the radio before t before we had a TV, you Red Star, Belgrade and Rangers and their big nights and Man United and the rest of it. Um, so I knew, of course, I knew the history of Rangers, but they were in a championship at the time and been relegated and all the financial issues that are well documented. Um, and David West said, you need to meet me. And we need to meet them. So we did. And we had a good first meeting, really good first meeting with them. And you realise the enormity of the club. But I was still, don't forget, no disrespect to Rangers and it never would be disrespectful to Rangers. But um, I still had some really good offers from big, big English clubs. And it was my son who actually went out to the YouTube and there was a penny, a, a, one of the songs they sing, Penny Arcade. And there's an eight minute clip of an old firm game at Ibrox at the far end, all, all Celtic, with the rest, Rangers fans. And an atmosphere you cannot believe, Christy. And my, my son, who played football and pro football, said to me, Dad, you cannot, you cannot turn down Rangers if they come in. And we had the second interview and I was sold. When I saw that and you realise it and then you walk out Ibox and you see Ibox and the, the staircase and the marble halls and, um, you know, David Weir had a massive part to play because he's, he's on the Hall of Fame quite rightly and he's a legend of the club. Um, so David Weir's word, you always listen to. But um, my son also played a small part as well, Christy, but what a great decision to go to a fantastic football club. Is that process overwhelming, Mark? Do you kind of go to a big institution and the fan base is so... Uh, on top of everything that happens at a football club and the rivalry so significant. How was that for you? Because, again, listening to interviews with past players and past managers, sometimes they, they mention they live outside of Glasgow because of the the animosity that happens and everything surrounding two big footballing giants within within the, the west side of Scotland. How was that for you in terms of managing the emotional aspects of, of the club and trying to get the club back to where you, you think they belong? Again, I can't highlight Davies' role highly enough. Also, Frank McParland, who is a, is a Liverpool for 20 years, one of the best recruiters in the world, in my mind, and has been a very, very strong colleague and good good friend. He was up there with us as well. So we had, we had good people. Jim Stewart, the goalkeeping coach, we had good people. My City background, it kept on giving, Christy, in terms of, you know, I'd been headhunted by various big global banks and um, you go through the interview processes and you get some big jobs and you're speaking and you're doing your contracts and you're going into new environments and you're dealing with, imagine you walk into a dealing with and you're the new guy and you walk in and you're sitting on one of the big money earning desks and everyone's looking at you. What's this guy like? Because people want that desk. People in, internally want that desk. You walk in and suddenly you're, you're there. So who's a new guy? So how you act, how you conduct yourself, how you speak, all the things I spoke to you about earlier. But at the end of the day, you've got to show that you're good enough to do the job. So you've been through that process over a period of 20 plus years. Um, so that held me in really good stead. So going into Rangers, David Weir, again, mine, mine of information for me, um, do my own research. But it's also you've got to have the confidence and make sure you speak to the fans in the right way. And what really, one thing that really annoyed me was that people would say to you, you don't know the enormity of the job. And I said, well, what tells you that? Well, you've never been, you've never been, you've never been played an old firm game. You never lived in Glasgow. You don't, you know what it's all about. And the ignorance from certain people was beyond belief, Christy, because you go there and you cannot fail to understand what it means. You do go into a complete goldfish bowl, unlike anything else you could, you've ever experienced. When we played Celtic in the old firm in the semi final, uh, Frank had been to all the Liverpool, Frank had been to Istanbul with Liverpool winning the Champions League and, he said, "This is I've never seen anything like this in my life. Crowds, eight, you know, five, six, seven deep, all the way to the stadium, and then the noise. And they're a huge club, but you realise that it's it's I don't use the word religion for obvious reasons, but it, it's it means so much to so many people. I watched a Newcastle game last night against PSG. You could see my dad was a diehard Geordie. What it means to them in that it's a different level of passion. I, I'm not I'm not disrespecting any." fans of other clubs, my own included. 
but it's a level of passion up there, Christy, which you have to go. If, you, if you're a football fan, an old firm game's got to be in your bucket list. And it's understanding what it means to people. And I never had any animosity in terms of in where I lived. I lived in, okay, I lived in the blue part of town, but fantastic people, fantastic city, um, magnificent club. And I keep using the word privilege because I think anyone in that position is totally privileged to say you've managed a club of that, of that size and stature. And what was it like for you going into that semi-final? You mentioned the old firm game at Hampton. How did you try and adopt a positive mindset going into a game where you are the underdogs championship team playing against obviously the league leaders any anything that you can relate to in terms of your leadership and management there that was significant in terms of winning that fixture no I think as I say it's, it's about the staff we do it all together it's not about one person ever everyone contributes in you know large or small way but I think the, the key one was self-belief we had played really well in, through the season we won the championship by 11 odd points or more we won this training cup. There'd been a Hamden and there'd been a sellout Blue you know, Rangers crowd, basically. And they were used to that. But uh, I've said again many times, but, you know, in the hotel before, we stayed at Mar Hall, which is a Rangers hotel. And we had a lot of young guys, Christy, a lot of young players. Our, our budget was a fraction of Celtics but, yeah, uh, and a very low salary, along with Jason Holt and Andy Halliday. Their combined salary was less than a third of one of the Celtic midfield players. You know, so it was a different, it was a different nine times out of 10 Celtic would win that game. The going in the night before was just utter belief. And we reinforced we are where we are for a reason. Uh, and the worst thing you can do is to leave the pitch with, with, with regret. You know, so no doubts going in, no regrets coming off. And, and we sort of hammered that home all season. And I think that's when you have senior players, the likes of Kenny Miller and, and Lee Wallace, outstanding, outstanding. And then we had the rest of the guys. And to a man looking around the night before, we didn't see any nerves. They were just desperate for the game to start. Imagine you're 20 years old, you're going to play an old firm game at the National Stadium. You know, it to mean so much to so many people globally because these, these two clubs have global reach. And they were, they were fearless going in. So that was a really, really pleasing thing from the point of view that um, as a group, as a group of staff and players, we'd got the environment right and they had, they had responded appropriately and they delivered a fantastic performance and deserved to win the game. How did you cope with that high... And then after playing Hibernian in the final and obviously uh, l losing in the final, how, how did you deal with that in terms of the highs and lows of football? Because uh, obviously such a significant win and, and a self-belief as, as mentioned, but obviously from a, an overall perspective, wasn't necessarily the outcome that you, you set out to achieve in terms of that um, that cup competition. How, how did you deal with that as a manager and, and kind of getting over that to... to pursue further well thank but pilot's got a great saying he always says never too high never too low you know so and you see too many people in football christy who, who win a game or some, they win a trophy or whatever it may be and they're shouting and jumping and screaming and and then you lose a game and it's it's the end of the world is nigh and it, it can't be that high and that low you have to have a more balanced approach um for me it, the delight of celtic was great the worry for me was that immediately i knew the expectation was going to go through the roof not so much about the final, because everyone just expects us to win the final in. Um, and, you know, that's another story about why. And I'll be very honest, as I've always said, that the semi final, 99 times out of 100, Celtic will win that. They were a squad packed with internationals, they're top of the Premier League, going to win it for the X year in a row. And, um, you know, they're going to win that game more times than not. Patrick Roberts missed from five yards out. You know, we, we had a 30 yard screamer from Barry Mackay, but we still played very, very well. But the expectation was was roaring, and that was the biggest one. So the high was great of winning the game. Hibernian, of course, we were down to bare bones on players, so the, the, it's not an excuse. I've been very honest. Good luck to Hibernian. They won the game, but we were out on our feet, and we only named four subs and all these type of things. But the bigger picture for me was this overriding fear that the expectation had become had reached an unrealistic level, um, and this was absolutely confirmed for the first game of the Premier League season at home. Stadium looked magnificent. I got there at nine in the morning, Christy. Um, three o'clock kickoff. I always got there early, went to my office, had a cup of tea, did a bit of work, confirmed that like, the team talk and what you're going to say. And then David Weir would come in and we'd talk about the team, any final changes. And I walked down the stadium and it's just, as I say, huge, fantastic stadium. And I see going for 55 on the far side. And that's the 55th title, the, the record for Rangers and everything else. Yeah. And I realised, wow, that I, that for the, I had not said a nail. It, I just knew that 
the expectation was not right. You know, we were still budget budget wise, we were way, way behind Celtic. Way behind Celtic. They had the likes of Dembele and Brown, all these various players. Armstrong, Rogic, you know, all these bit on all these players, Tierney, of course. And you're looking going, wow, look at this team in terms of budget, international players. And we still had recruited very, very you know, cheaply and not cheaply in, in a derogatory way, but we'd obviously money was was nowhere near the same level as Celtic. And yet the expectation was that we were now going to go and win the title. And it, uh, just my same pragmatism, my city background, you always look at consequences and I'm thinking this is this is so dangerous. And we drew that game with Hamilton, a team we should beat. No disrespect, they know we should be a bigger club, bigger budget to them. We drew two, I believe it was, and and got some booze and disappointment, and the media suddenly turned. You know, a disastrous start for Rangers. First game back in the top flight, and it's a disastrous start to get a point at home. And then you know that now you just see the slippery slope start to come because um, I, I changed tacks a little bit, but very relevant I hope when I landed in Glasgow first day I was met by a reporter a really good guy who said to me never forget there's a good cop and a bad cop in Glasgow never too bad never too good you would have a good cop and a bad cop he went right now you're going to be such a good cop and I said what well, if I lose my first six games he went you're the good cop one is the bad cop one he died like. so I went really and I saw the abuse that one he received outrageous it wouldn't, I've, I've said many times it would never happen down south Christy and he was a bad cop and then yeah. Brendan came in and Brendan and I shaking hands, the trophy and blue and green and everything else. And the guy said, careful, you're now the bad cop. And I'm thinking, what's he talking about? But of course, you don't realize that until you are the bad cop. <laughs>